One thing that actually <laughs> is a, a, a great hack to use in the sales world, but if someone rejects you, if someone says no, asking them, you know, and first of all, this isn't a way to try and turn it around to turn it into a yes. And ultimately, every salesperson, you have to get used to getting a lot of no's. And in fact, every person in the world, I think you should get used if you're, if you're leading a big and fulfilling life. People will say no to you often, especially if you're stretching yourself. But a great hack is to ask somebody where they say no to you, what would you have needed to hear in order to have said yes? Or, you know, in, in a more simple way, what made you say no in this scenario? Um, I find in general, people are actually quite willing to give you feedback. And it actually might build a great relationship with somebody out of doing that, even someone that you don't particularly know. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Today we have James Howell again. This is the second time um, to have James on his own. So thank you very much for joining us, James, this morning for your time. And uh, we we'll to continue the topic of last time, so uh, actionable tips, sales tips that we can use in everyday life. And uh, I'll give you the floor just in a second. I mm -hmm. also noticed that you have uh, a couple of articles that have been uh, uh, present on LinkedIn, but uh, I think that we haven't actually talked much about uh, the ideas you shared. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's start, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, that's totally, totally good for me. I'm curious, which was the um, article that you read? I only have a couple that are up on there, but yeah. I wish I was turning them out like Tim does. I know he's, I love Tim's articles. He's always got new ones coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the one I found, oh, let me, let me get there, is uh, on being a Rogerian sales trainer. <laughs> ah, right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll really quickly introduce myself. I'm, I'm more than happy to um, share a little bit about that article. That one was uh, an important one for me to write. Um, but for those who don't know me, I'm my name's James. I am Canadian, but I'm living here in Japan and uh, uh, here with my wife. We've been here for almost a year now, which is crazy. Time flies. It's been maybe uh, almost 11 months. So we're getting, we're getting there. Uh, I'm really into learning Japanese. That's something I have a huge focus. Right now I'm reading... Kiki's Delivery Service, the um, movie in Japanese, and uh, it takes me roughly five minutes to read one page, but it's okay. We'll, we'll get there. There's only 200 to go, and I'll get there eventually. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the reason I'm here is because I work in sales. That's My background is in sales and specifically sales training. Um, for the past few years, I've been, I've been a sales trainer. And uh, I, yeah, I just find sales training to be, or, or sales in general, not only to be skills that are directly applicable to sales, but also life skills. And um, I really feel like a lot of the skills that we can learn inside of sales or inside of that arena are directly applicable to our everyday lives and can just help us communicate with people better um, and help us, you know, lead a life that we, we desire to lead, let's say. Um, and I do have some stuff directly to talk about that today. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, because this is something I've been doing with my wife for the past uh, a number of months now, is we run a um, real estate company in Japan, and uh, or sorry, in Yokohama specifically. Um, and we are kind of working to uh, specifically help foreigners buy and sell houses or investment properties here in Japan. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to, to mention as well. And actually, that's directly related to <laughs> the topic that I'm going to talk about today in terms of some fears that people have in sales and uh, some ways to overcome those fears. Um, before I jump into that, though, I would, I would mention, I know there's only a couple people, if anyone has questions or anything, please feel free to just jump in and, and ask. I'm more than happy to engage uh, with any questions. Um, but that, that article on being a Rogerian sales trainer, um, which is the article uh, that Maya has shared. It's something I wrote last year. At that time, I was training a lot of um, future salespeople and people who are already working in sales. And uh, I was also reading this, or I had been for the past year, I was really into this psychologist named Carl Rogers. And um, Carl Rogers, I mean, Tim or Maya, are you familiar with Carl Rogers? 
Oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm not. So maybe you can help us, familiar. Yeah, I'm not either. But real quick, I, I tried clicking on the link, and I'm I can't. Page is not available, so I don't know what if it's me or. Well, it's if you go on my profile, it's under my um, what are they like the special articles or the featured articles? Um, so you can find it there as well. But Carl Carl Rogers was this person. You kind of consider him to be the leader of what's called person-centered therapy. So he was a, a therapist and a psychologist. Um, and a big thing about <laughs> the reason why I wrote this is because his, w one of his main prefaces is that people need to feel comfortable and they need to feel safe in order to grow as a person. And um, when I train and when I, you know, it's, it's a huge focus of mine when I'm doing sales training is to make sure that people in my class feel like they're in a safe space and like they can make mistakes and that they can try new things and they're not going to be judged by myself and hopefully not going to be judged by the other people in the class so that they're willing to put themselves out there and try new things. Um, it's a big aspect of Carl Rogers' teachings and it's just something that I kind of took to heart. So if you, uh, yeah, if you check out that article, I kind of go into some detail as to why I decided to kind of use his style of therapy in my um, in my sales training. And uh, yeah, it was it was a real delight to to write. It was one of the first articles I ever wrote. Um, so please feel free to check it out. And let me know what you think about it after you read it. That'd be cool. And this actually, it's it's interesting that you brought up that article because this ties in directly to what I was planning on talking about today. Um, in the previous episode, just as a reminder, I went over some skills. Um, and, and some tactics around, uh, you know, communication tactics and just some kind of general truths about, um, how sales works as a quick reminder. Some of those things were, um, uh, to remind ourselves that, you know, in this day and age, everybody has tons of access to information and reviews and things like that. And for that reason, skills like listening and, uh, you know, asking great questions and um, not necessarily having a big agenda when you're going in to try and sell something is, uh, is you know, tends to be more, you tend to see more success with that. Um, but on the other side, I mean, I feel like if you don't understand sales skills, it can really lead to you having a challenge selling things. Um, we're not born natural salespeople. I mean, I, I certainly wasn't. And, uh, but on the other side, the other thing that can really stop people from seeing success in sales is fear. And that is what the topic I wanted to go over today. Um, fear is something that is felt by everybody. And I'm going to go into some ex examples here. Um, but, you know, for a lot of people, the idea of persuading somebody to do something like giving them money is incredibly terrifying. You know, the idea of like getting someone to give away one of their most important resources, which could be their time, it could be their money. You know, it's a very, very scary thing. So between learning sales skills and fear, I see both of those as important things to, you know, figure out. But fear can actually be the bigger problem for people because skills can be learned. And fear, I mean, you can learn to overcome fear, but quite often fear just kind of hides in the shadows and you don't quite realize that it is there. Um, sometimes, you know, I myself operated for an extremely long time and probably do still operate in areas of my life where I do have fears of things and I'm not really even aware of it, but it really is stopping me from maybe achieving the things that I want to do. Um, it can paralyze people and, and stop them from doing yeah, what they really desire. Um, so a couple of really classic fears that people will come across fear of being, especially in sales, but this also could be applicable outside of sales fear of being pushy, you know, the fear of being the, you know, the classic example is the used car salesperson. And I, I've actually met some really nice used car salespeople. So I don't think that that's a fair example all the time. Um, but unfortunately they kind of, they are the example. It seems like these days. Um, but yeah, that fear of being pushy. You know, a lot of people are very, very afraid that if they, you know, try and get somebody to buy something or, you know, if they try and bring this new idea up, do new idea up to someone, that they're going to be seen as pushy. Um, going along the same lines, a fear of asking for something. And I specifically think of money in that case. You know, I know of salespeople, and I have to say myself included, when I first started in sales, I was very afraid of actually asking for the sale actually saying, hey, do you want to, in some way, hey, do you want to buy this thing? Do you want to spend money on this thing? 
Um, these all kind of pile into each other. The fear of someone finding that what you do isn't valuable, you know, and that kind of ties into this general fear of judgment. You know, what if, what if this person doesn't like it? What if they think it's a waste of time? What if they think that me being here is a waste of time, you know, and all of these kind of boil down into the biggest one of all. And they're really all offshoots of this, which is a fear of projection, you know, a fear of people saying no to us. And that is by far, I can say this with certainty, that is by far the biggest thing that holds salespeople, entrepreneurs, um, or any other area where you are looking to try and do something that is maybe outside of your comfort zone. That is the number one thing that holds you back. You know, you could say fear of failure as well. I really see fear of failure as also being a fear of rejection. You know, it's a fear of not being accepted or your idea is not being accepted, which means perhaps that you aren't being accepted. Um, and it's a really, really strong fear. When we are rejected, there's actually been studies that have been done that show that the same part of the brain that reg registers actual pain, so physical pain, if you were to get like pricked by a pin or something, or worse, uh, the same part of the brain that registers actual pain, that is the same part that registers that fear or, or when you get rejected. So even though it is not a physical uh, pain, it is more of an emotional pain, um, the same part of the brain fires up. And, you know, I actually have to say that this is something that I, I feel as if a lot of people who are on this call at the moment um, have dealt with. <laughs> I'm going to go into detail about this and how we have all dealt with this. But when I think about people on this call, I think about there's definitely a number of people on the call who have, who are bilingual or maybe know m multiple languages. Um, for me personally, as someone who is learning Japanese, this fear of rejection or fear of failure comes up all the time. You know, like maybe I, I want to go and say something to somebody or I want to try and say something. And I have this like mental battle with myself. So, oh, should I say it? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I'm going to say it wrong. What are they going to think if I say it wrong? And um, so I just, I just want to kind of put that out there that this is, this doesn't have to be only in the sales environment. You know, this is something that I think can be applied to almost any aspect of life, but it is really in your face when you're in a sales role. Um, a few examples of how this plays out when you have a fear of rejection or, or it could be a fear of failure as well. What that often plays out as is you might feel paralyzed to do something, you know, Example in sales, you don't reach out to people, even though you know that you want to reach out to them, you don't end up doing it. Maybe you want to reach out to them to try and set up a meeting so that you can um, try and sell them something or, you know, get them into your sales pipeline and you don't end up doing it because you're, you're, you're worried about what might happen, what they might think. Or maybe you are doing something, but you don't go kind of fully all in and you don't try, you know, with your, put yourself really out there on the line, you kind of play it safe. And, you know, I think that there's a place for playing it safe from time to time, but that can also lead to you just not fully giving it the effort that is required in order to get the result that you want. Even slightly outside of sales, not going for the next job movement, maybe not going for a particular job that you really are interested in, not starting a new endeavor, whether that's, you know, a local meetup or a business, you know, just not going for it because you have something that comes into your mind that stops you not speaking up about something. Um, so the reality is, is that if you want to do something that is a stretch for you, whether, you know, that is making sales or starting a business or a personal goal that interests you, you really do need to face rejection. Um, rejection is a part of a fulfilling and meaningful life. And again, I, I just think about some people on the call who have, I think that learning languages is a really good example of this. How fulfill, despite the fact that you probably fell on your face multiple times and probably still do to this day fall on your face um, within that language that you've learned, uh, I think that that's probably been incredibly fulfilling and meaningful for you. Um, it's absolutely also part of business. You know, not everybody is going to say yes to you and uh, <laughs> you're going to be rejected a lot. And any person who has started a successful business, rejection is something that they have probably faced time and time again. And lastly, and this is one of the reasons why we're here today, it is something that you can work on. You know, it's something that you can become aware of, and it's something that you can work with 
and continue to catch and uh, yeah, compassionately work through, as I like to say. So I'm going to pause in just a second, but before I do, um, what I'm going to go through is just three general truths about uh, the fear of rejection. And then I'm going to talk about what you can do about it. And I'll give you two kind of quick specific tactics that you can use um, whenever you are feeling that fear of rejection that is preventing you from not only make sales, but move forward in, in some way or another. Um, but I'm going to pause for now and just curious, are there any questions or any thoughts? Uh, what, what Anything coming to mind from anyone? And if not, that's okay too. No, thank you, James. While I, I was listening to you, I was thinking about, uh, you know, the fear of being pushy and hmm. uh, how actually how much, you know, it is part of my, uh, how, what a big part of uh, my general fear, you know, of doing things it, it hmm. is. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but I don't want to be perceived as somebody who pushes people into doing this or to, into doing that. So mm -hmm. it's really a big part of, um, you know, my hesitation or let's say it just keeps me um, inactive sometimes because, yeah, I don't want to, to be seen as a pushy person. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for letting, letting us know about it, you know, that this is a very valid fear, actually, because at some point I thought that I was a strange, you know, individual and so on and so on, but it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing, Matt. Yeah, I, I, I can relate to what Maya said, especially if you've been in Japan for a long time, you know that pushy is even worse here probably than where I'm from. And uh, so some of that is kind of inside you just through the exposure and, you know, I guess by osmosis, you see how things are done here. Um, so that may be a factor at play, certainly for me, I think. Um, I, just a couple points about, you know, you mentioned fear, fear of rejection. In my case, it was always like, the more importantly I viewed something, the more pressure and fear I felt. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of, in my case, if, if you don't care, if you're willing to walk away, there's little fear, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one uh, company that was courting me. And I really didn't want the job. Yeah, I, and so I was kind of hoping they'd reject me. Um, and I kept turning them down. And the third time, uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I took it. But I would have mm -hmm. never gotten to that point if I had thought, I really want this job, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then this isn't really related to sales so much, but you're talking about learning a language. My biggest um, obstacle to learning Japanese was fear of making a fool of, um, of myself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, oh, am I going to miss a word? Am I going to say it the wrong way? Are they going to laugh at me? And it mm -hmm. really took me a while to get past that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you are afraid, you're not going to practice. And you're, you're not going to put yourself out there and try. And I think what helped me get over it was human relationships that I had developed and where, where I was comfortable um, putting myself out there because I had developed a human relationship with a, actually a group of Japanese folks. And uh, so even in like the, learning a language, you know, being able to get past that, that fear was... What was my biggest barrier? I, I don't know how people in the audience feel about it, but um, but I, I have a question after all these comments, right? So how do you balance knowledge of your own weaknesses and still pushing forward? Any thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, that's a great question. Um, I suppose that the way that I balance it is, and this is actually something that I'm, I'm going to speak about in a little bit, but I, this is a great time to get into it now. The way that I balance it is, first of all, by recognizing that we all have these fears, right? Like these fears, it's just something that is natural to all of us. You know, as Maya was saying, that fear of being pushy 
That is just a very, very normal thing. And so many people have that same fear. You know, likely the person that you're worried about being pushy towards uh, has that same fear. But also, it is a, it's almost a, a natural thing that we need to, we need to embrace the fact that if we want to understand how to do something, and I hope I'm answering your question. Let me know if I, I missed something. But um, we need to embrace the fact that we don't understand something fully in order to understand it better. And, you know, if I don't have a full amount of knowledge on something, um, it doesn't mean that I can't engage in that subject. And sure, I may be, um, I may end up making a bit of a fool of myself in some way or another. But also, there's other ways to get around it. If you're talking in a subject that you don't know particularly well, you could share that with somebody. You know, for example, in my current job, I'm working in real estate. There are literally millions of things about Japanese real estate that I don't know. But I don't pretend to know those things either. You know, if I don't understand something, then I'm okay with telling the person that, hey, I don't, I actually don't know the answer to this, but I know people who do. And if it's okay, I'll get back to you about this. Um, does that answer your question, Tim, just to make sure? Yeah, um, I, it does. And, you know, and the, the reason I brought it up is if, if I go back and look at my career, I, I kept jumping you know, uh, through my career to new things that <laughs> were, were completely new to me, you know, and, uh, and yet I, I don't know why, but I did it probably because I had to, you know, mm. I, I, I had no, no I, I don't, I don't want to say I had no choice, but opportunities were offered to me mm -hmm. that, you know, part, part of it, I wanted to get out of the A Kaiwa racket, you know, the English conversation racket. So that was like my first, okay, I'm going to do this because I just don't want to do, keep doing what I'm doing now, right? So mm -hmm. uh, maybe there was a fear of just being stagnant too and, and not moving forward. And, and in every case, every career change I made, I, I made a big leap, but man, just originally make, taking the plunge was just so terrifying to me, you know? Um, and so somehow I did it. And if you're married and you have bills to pay, that's a big motivation, fear of not having an income, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So which fear is worse, you know? Not having an income or trying something new? I guess I'm going to try something new, right? So <laughs> that's, anyway, that's yeah. personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, actually, there's a couple things you said that throughout this, I'm going to come back and I'm going to tie into what we what uh, what I talk about here, because you brought up some, some good examples. Um, and also, actually, it sounds very similar to me. I, I there's something I, I enjoy about jumping into new things. I also have very much I have mental battles before jumping in and while I've, after I've jumped into it and even during questioning, you know, what, what have I done? Do I know what I'm doing? Um, what happens if it all goes wrong? And um, okay, so three just quick truths about this fear of rejection. First of all, like it is a totally natural human trait. And Tim, when you brought up a few of those things that you were thinking when you wanted to go and speak Japanese when you were first learning and you were worried about doing it, um, you know, what might they think? And, you know, are they going to laugh at me? This fear of rejection is a natural human trait. We all have it in some way or another. And the reason for that is because being accepted within a group or a tribe is essential to our human nature. And that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It goes back to a point where if you were rejected, you would not be able to survive. You would be put outside of the tribe and you'd be left alone to fend for yourself. And at that time, I'm talking like way, 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 way back. I don't know the exact figure, but thousands and thousands of years ago, if you were left alone, you wouldn't be able to survive. You know, that's the reason why humans have been able to evolve to the place that we're at now and get to the place that we're at now in the world is because we group together and we work on things together. So if you're out of the group, you're kind of screwed. At least this was thousands and thousands of years ago. But the thing is that nowadays that isn't quite the case. You know, you, of course, it's extremely rewarding to have human relationships, but we have this hardwired belief that this is, you know, if someone rejects us, if it says no, it is dangerous. And the reality is, is that most of the things, in fact, I would argue to say almost all of the things that we, that we get rejected for these days are not life or death things. And these are actually things that can be dealt with. More often than not, they are actually very insignificant things. Someone saying no to you on a sales call 
It's not a life or death thing. There are many, many, many other fish in the sea that you could go and try and talk to. Um, so I'd say that that understanding that truth and how it lives inside of all of us, you know, it's incredibly liberating to be like, hey, you know what? This is just part of who I am. And I am going to have this fear and I can push past it. And this is actually just part of being a human being. Another thing is that, and this one, it, it, it can um, be a bit tough to reckon with, but often this fear of rejection is tied to some of the worst fears that we have about ourselves, kind of in our core being. And the three most classic ones that people will face are not smart enough, not attractive enough, or just in some way or another, not good enough. And I'm sure that those resonate with some people here on the call, um, myself included. I'll tell you my experience in just a moment. But it often ties back to our childhood. In fact, it almost certainly does. Um, and if you think about it, when we're kids, we're so willing to be rejected. We don't care about rejection. Like a kid will ask a million times for something and they'll have no shame about asking for it a million times, even if they keep on hearing no. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They just, okay, cool. They just keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. But eventually something happens and it changes the way that we perceive ourselves and the way that we perceive the world. And this is as we start to get a little bit older, perhaps something happens. And then we start to have this belief in our mind around something to do with the way that the world works. And this is how this fear of rejection kind of evolves. More often than not, what we do after that is we kind of collect evidence to make that true. The example for me is that, you know, from a very young age, I just didn't think I'm smart. Uh, and, you know, my, my dad, I consider him to be a super smart guy. Uh, my sister is, like, brilliant, you know, my older sister. And uh, I just had a very, very hard time at school. And in comparison to my sister and also my father, I think that I just made an agreement with myself at some point in my childhood where I was just like, hey, you're not very smart. You have all this evidence here that you're not very smart. And um, I'm just going to believe that now. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't realize this until I was quite a bit older, you know, and doing a bit of work on myself. But those kind of fears that we have within ourselves will show up in that fear of rejection. If I'm going to go and speak to somebody about a particular topic, I really worry that the person is maybe going to see that I'm not smart, you know, and whether this is true or not true, it doesn't matter. I've come to recognize that I'm actually a heck of a lot smarter than my brain tells me that I am. But I ha like the, this thing is just kind of lives there inside of me and exploring these things and just kind of recognizing that, hey, maybe I have this thing that is just going to constantly be there. There's a power that comes along with that. If I can say, hey, you know what? You're doing that thing again, where you're telling yourself that you can't do this for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, and that's probably been there for a long time. And just to know that and to be aware of that, I think is powerful. And you can, you can start to move forward. I can start to have sales conversations with people who have been doing their job for 20 years. And I've only been selling in this industry for one year. And prior to, you know, and, and it's, it's scary because I think that they know so much more about it than they, than I do, which they do, but it doesn't mean that it, 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 it'll, it has to stop you from having a conversation with them. Um, okay. And the last one of these truths is rejections often have as much to do or even more to do with the other person than you. I mean, I love, we love this saying with my wife and I, it takes two to tango. And, uh, we often perceive a rejection as being 100% on us. If someone says no to me, if I ask them to have a meeting with me and they say no, well, it's because they didn't like what I said. It's because they don't appreciate my product. It's because they think it's going to be a waste of their time. It's going to be this or that. But rejections always have the other side of the equation. And ultimately, you have to remind yourself that people think about themselves much more than they think about anyone else. And there could be a million things going on in a person's life that leads them to say no to something, you know, in the, just the sales example, maybe they recently bought something else. Maybe it, they bought something else that has nothing to do with your product, but they're like, oh, I can't, I can't spend money on something else. I, I'm just going to ignore this message or I'm, I'm going to let this go or whatever. They might have a problem with something else that's bigger than whatever you're talking about, or they have something that's going on completely outside of business. You know, maybe their kid is sick and they have to go to the, uh, they have to go to the school to pick up their kid and they, you know, forgot to cancel the meeting with you. Um, 
or that just takes you know a huge amount of precedent and they don't care about whatever it is that you are going to be talking about but they're not rejecting you they simply have something else going on so i'm gonna i'll pause there any thoughts anything come to people's minds i'm gonna check if there's anything in the chat don't yeah i uh, yeah i uh back to the fear you know or sticking with the fear theme you know i think all of us to different degrees experience in some form childhood trauma right and some of it's self-imposed so for example going to school and not getting the best grades and you know convincing yourself you're not smart in, in a sense that's like this message that you're reinforcing based on what the school system that mm-hmm. is probably i think we could all agree quite limited in really what measuring your intelligence and, you know they have mm-hmm. their standards which are narrow and yeah you're not um living up to their standards on what they think makes you smart uh so you know there's there's that trauma right and you know if you're in a home where your parents are telling you you're no good you're stupid or you have older siblings that are you know making you feel inadequate or you know one sibling gets more attention than you do i think all of these can feed into that fear and and as you mentioned it's so deeply seated mm-hmm. it's almost like not just for sales but for a lot of things it almost seems like all of us could use some therapy you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean um, what i'm going to get to here and i you kind of led right into it what to do i mean what to do about this we if we recognize that we we all deal with this you know it's often tied to as you were saying there it could be childhood traumas or the worst fears that we have about ourselves which is often tied to our childhoods and you know also recognizing that quite often it's not totally to do with us but it's to do with other people um as well uh what can we do about it so one thing and, and this is what tim was just saying i would say uh, preface this before i give you some things that you can do on your own i mean talking to someone about it is a great way to handle it you know if you it could be a therapist it could be a coach it could be a close friend of yours someone who you trust you know i would i would recommend that you you um have a conversation with somebody about it if these things that i'm mentioning here about a fear of rejection whether it's in a sales context or outside you know consider doing that um because you might uncover some of these things you might shine a light on something through a conversation with someone that you then get to recognize is there in the future the way that i i like to describe this is that when you talk about a problem or like this maybe fear that you're having with someone it makes the problem like an actual thing between you and somebody else or or like a thing that's there in front of you it's no longer just living in your head it's like this act, i'm making a kind of gesture with my hands like a ball but it's 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 there in front of you and you can in- inspect it better you can have a conversation with somebody about it and better understand what it is and it's no longer this thing that lives in your head it actually lives in real life um and with somebody else so highly recommend doing that But secondly, I mean just on your own, simply being aware of a fear of rejection and being aware of the fact that wow, this is this is what's going on right now. I'm afraid, you know, if you're procrastinating doing something that you really want to do and you catch yourself feeling anxious or scared, that awareness is really powerful. And if you can instead of trying to distract yourself away from it or try and avoid it, just kind of sit there with it and and maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but catching yourself when you're feeling anxious or scared and just kind of compassionately asking yourself what's going on you know wh- what am i afraid of at the moment what is what is in my mind at the moment um you know maybe it is some type of specific rejection maybe it's what people will think about you and plenty of different things you could write those things down in a journal um or you could just say it out loud to yourself i truly believe that just awareness of these things is one of the most powerful things that you can have. Um so even in this conversation now that we've had this conversation, perhaps next time that you find yourself in that kind of paralyzed state of not quite feeling like moving forward on something that you're interested in, stopping and asking yourself, "Hey, what's going on here?" Um and lastly, recognizing that rejection is an essential aspect of growth. Um and rejection whether that's some type of failure whether that's making mistakes whether that is you know um doing something that 
just doesn't go well at all. Um, and the example of, you know, trying to speak Japanese to someone when you're still learning or trying to speak English to someone when you're still learning or, or any language. Um, I, I really love this term. We don't give birth to full grown babies, you know, and actually another saying that just came to my mind about that is that, you know, you have to suck at something in order to be kind of good at something eventually. <laughs> um, and, you know, that all dials back to rejection. You have to be willing to make those mistakes in order to improve. And it really is a fast track to learning. It's, it's, it is the thing that you can do that is going to improve in a, or going to help have you improve. A classic example of this, and this ties directly to sales, but also just to business building in general, is the kind of lean startup example. People have, I can't remember who wrote the book, but there's a book called Lean Startup. And um, one, uh, I, I do recommend checking out this book. Um, this methodology is used by a lot of startups these days. And I'm not saying that it's, it's a perfect methodology, but it really goes into the, the um, fear of rejection directly. But basically, it is. Imagine two different examples of somebody starting a business. One person, they build, they want to build a product that they believe is going to be this perfect product that people are going to love to use. They might spend a year or two years building a product and then shipping it out there and getting it in front of people as this kind of finished, amazing product. Um, and then on the other side, think of a person who instead, they don't build you know, a great product they instead think that they've figured out a need that some people have. They build a minimum viable product. You know, maybe it's kind of rough around the edges. Maybe it doesn't work perfectly right, but they put it out there in the public and they get feedback because as they give it to someone, someone's going to try it. They're going to, they're going to immediately figure out, are people interested in this in the first place? Secondly, there are people are going to tell them, well, this is what's good about it. And this is what sucks about it or what doesn't work about it. And this is how it's not working. And as they get that feedback, they can just keep on iterating. And, um, you know, between those two, the other person, they might spend two years working on a product and waiting until it's quote unquote perfect to release it. And then when they do release it and they go to sell it, maybe the time has passed. Maybe there isn't actually a need that people have. Maybe there's this glaring product or this great glaring problem that they didn't see that they, um, or that they missed. And the market kind of can immediately tell, Hey, this isn't, uh, this isn't something that we want. So that rejection, it is just an essential aspect of growth. When you feel that fear saying, ah, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I want to do this. Sit there, examine it, compassionately ask yourself what's going on. And just remind yourself that leaning into that and just going directly towards it is almost always the best way to grow. You know, it's a growth inducing thing. And that's kind of what Tim was saying earlier with, uh, you know, jumping into some of these areas of work that he didn't know much about, but, you know, the amount of growth that comes out, even though it's very scary, the amount of growth that comes out of that on the other side is huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I, I was just going to, I wanted to comment on Richard Walton's comment and yeah, I, I, I completely agree with your point. You know, the confidence to admit that you, you don't know something I is absolutely true. Um, and, you know, thinking, you know, as we're talking, I'm thinking about my own career again and, Especially when I when I made the transition to manufacturing, I, I didn't know anything about manufacturing. I'm not a technical guy. I'm not an engineer, and and suddenly this company is inviting me to go to America and, and start up a new factory. I, and part of me was terrified. Um, and I think one thing that I did, and I I, I wasn't like conscious of it was I played to my strengths um, almost in intuitively. And my strength at the time, and I think it's still a strength, is developing relationships of trust with Japanese folks. And so when I was recruited, I had already developed uh, strong relationships with like 10 Japanese guys who were on this team. And that was like, that, that, that kind of offset all the stuff I couldn't do and I didn't know that and and as Richard Walton mentioned you know I I also tried to be very honest and open and humble which the Japanese appreciate because they that tells them you're willing to learn right you're willing to mm -hmm. admit your weakness and they 
honestly wanted me to succeed, so they bent over backwards to help me. And it mm-hmm. all goes back to these relationships I had developed with them. Now, so mm-hmm. I don't know, you know how that plays into the equation, but the idea of figuring out how you can compensate for your weakness by you know, leveraging what you're good at. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great point. And I think that, you know, the, um, out of these, <laughs> the, I think that one of the things you tapped on there is that out of these, let's say rejections or maybe a failure in some way, like some type of mistake, people do generally want to see you succeed. And that ties back to the same reason that we're afraid of rejection, but it's that we work well as groups. And I think that we all innately understand that. And this isn't to say everybody is going to be your best friends, you know, when they reject you. But if you do have that type of relationship with people, you are able, more often than not, the person does want to, to help you and see you succeed. Um, one thing that actually <laughs> is a, a, a great hack to use in the sales world, and that very few people do this, but if someone rejects you, if someone says no, asking them, you know, and first of all, accepting that it's a no, this isn't a way to try and turn it around to turn it into a yes. And ultimately, every salesperson, you have to get used to getting a lot of no's. And in fact, every person in the world, I think you should get used if you're, if you're leading a big and fulfilling life. People will say no to you often, especially if you're stretching yourself. But a great hack is to ask somebody where they say no to you. Well, what would you have needed to hear in order to have said yes? Or you know, in, in a more simple way, why did you like, why is it a no? Can you just help me understand so that I better know for next time? What made you say no in this scenario? Um, in, in some way or another, I didn't kind of say that in the most eloquent way, but just kind of trying to get some feedback from people. I find in general, people are actually quite willing to give you feedback. And it actually might build a great relationship with somebody out of doing that, even someone that you don't particularly know. Um, so, and, and I have to say, I don't exactly know how, uh, how that plays into the um, Japanese culture, but from what uh, Tim is saying, you know, I think that this is something that, again, is a fairly human thing. Being vulnerable, asking somebody for that feedback or how you, how you could improve, um, people are generally willing to help. Yeah, but in a sense, I recruited them to be my mentors. Mm. I, I, I asked them to help me. And one thing, the Japanese, if you ask for help and you ask them to mentor you, uh, most cases, they're very willing and very kind if they see that attitude. So in my case, it, it worked. Um, but <laughs> yeah. the Roku is on stage. Thank you so much for coming up. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Maya san and James from the commission. Thank you for having me. Um, I, sorry to join at the very last moment, but I just want to, share one of my experience uh, at my company that uh, you know, you're talking about uh, sales and uh, <clears throat> uh, rejection. Our company, like other many uh, companies, provided uh, various training sessions to the newly hired people. So, but the, one of the, the unique program we have for uh, them is to go to the training facility, which is uh, located in a remote area. And what we do is that uh, we don't uh, we send them out of the town, um, uh, visit uh, individual houses, and asking for as that opportunity to clean their bathroom or a toilet. And uh, very uh, very unique. It's very different, and it's very hard because. That means that you are letting uh, strangers to the house and uh, clean your own bathroom or toilet. So that, that's uh, the purpose of the thing I did. And I was, uh, what am I doing here? And <laughs> what's the purpose of this training? But uh, that it's, you know, everybody should be a serious person. Whether you were in uh, HR or general affairs or financial department, you need to be a uh, uh, say you need to be selling customers or end use the service or the product you provide. So, um, so after the, some people get rejected, uh, twenty or thirty uh, houses, you know, you knock knock the door on each house. And asking for, would you please give me a chance to clean your bathroom or whatever? Um, 
that means that, that you get to use to, um, you know, you just uh, learn how to be humble, learn that uh, how to uh, teach yourself. And uh, that gives mm. that uh, experience a great deal. And I, th I think that's, that's a very unique thing. And after, you know, I was very lucky. Some people had got no, uh, no chance, not, didn't get to clean the bus. After five houses, I got a, you know, uh, I got a chance to clean and uh, they let me clean. So that was a great feeling that I achieved something and they accept me and I was so happy that uh, being humble, that the sense of uh, satisfaction and I, I think that that's the way, um, you know, the being uh, rejected is uh, no more, no longer fear to me since then. So um, that, that's my experience I wanted to share. And the other thing is that, uh, sorry, taking so much time, but I just wanted to say that uh, we have, uh, uh, I learned from the, our U.S. partners, the unique sales pitch is that uh, we call it diagnostic sales. That means if you go to the, your doctor or clinic, they never ask, uh, tell you about themselves, you know, how, how great they are, uh, uh, they are or how uh, prominent university they graduate. They ask you uh, as a patient a lot of questions. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. what, where it hurts? Where it happens? You know, you, you listen to them. And then uh, that's how you do it with your customer. Mm -hmm. So you don't talk about your uh, products or, or service or how great your company or yourself. First, you listen to them. And then, uh, okay, uh, what we do is uh, some this and this. Then is it something related to you or is this something that, that we can help you with your uh, issues or problems? That's, that's the diagnostic uh, sales uh, method. So um, I learned these two um in my company and I really appreciate it and I just wanted to share this. Thank you. Well, well, um, Hiroko san, thank you so much for uh, sharing. I mean, that, first of all, I have to say that training sounds amazing. Like to practice, to get out there and practice doing something like that on a variety of levels, I think just really sets people up for, yeah, being prepared to be rejected, but also, as you were saying, in training in humility and putting yourself out there. I mean, I've never heard of anything like that before. And it's, uh, at the same time, it's not unlike um, some other trainings that I've, I've come across where, and I've done myself where, yeah, you have to put yourself in a situation that is perhaps somewhat out of the ordinary and go ahead and do it. And, you know, as you said, after doing that training, wow, you felt like you could do anything. You weren't afraid of rejection. So that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for sharing. And, and I'll also say that with the diagnostic sales approach, I'm totally all for that. And I actually think that if, we, if I come back on again, that that's what I'm going to um, focus on. It's just about what I call discovery, but how to, um, you know, use that approach. And I'd love when I do that to hear, hear your thoughts on it. Thank you. Um, yeah. W one thing I do, I know we, we're almost at the end of time. So I just wanted to quickly mention one very, very quick tactic to use. If you ever have that fear of, uh, fear of rejection or fear of failure, whatever you want to call it, maybe a little bit more specific even. If you, have, if you notice that going on and you're in the situation where you want, um, you, you want to maybe start something new, you want to uh, reach out to somebody or, um, you know, you, but you feel paralyzed. This is from a, a pretty famous book by Mark Manson and um, he calls it the do something principle. And this is actually a remarkable principle, and this really, really works. And uh, if you're ever in a situation where you are feeling paralyzed, you're like deeply procrastinating on something, just doing anything, you know, at getting out, and, and it could actually be even something as simple as having a shower. I'm not sure how many people here have noticed that if you have a shower, you feel more ready to do something afterwards, you know, maybe hop in a shower and then you go and do something else. Just doing something will spur you on to take action on other things. If you do just a tiny action inside of the thing that you want to do or the thing that you're kind of paralyzed about doing, that can give you the motivation to keep moving forward. And motivation, the way that it works, I think a lot of people, myself included for a long time, I thought the motivation just kind of comes, like it just arrives and you almost like wait for motivation. But motivation really is driven out of action and if you take an action, that is what is going to spur you on to take more action. 
And that is a you know tried and tested way when you're worried about that fear, fear of failure or the fear of rejection to kind of lean into it head on and uh, try and try and make some move that's going to uh, going to make a difference. It doesn't have to be a big action. It can be a simple action. It actually doesn't even have to be directly related to what you're trying to do. So uh, I wanted to just add that in there. <clears throat> and I think that we're at the end of time. So thank you so very much, James, for this, uh, for the tactics and the tips. Uh, and uh, I think that we all need uh, them because depending on what stage of life uh, we are at or, you know, the situation we are in, we inevitably face fears, uh, be, of, be it of rejection or failure or, you know, even sometimes the imposter, imposter syndrome, which is, I believe, also somewhere, you know, in that spectrum. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to the third session, actually, uh, with you so that uh, we can continue the topic because uh, there is a lot to learn from you. And I'm so grateful to you that you are actually open to sharing all these tips with us here. Well, James, uh, a few words maybe in uh, conclusion before we wrap up. Yeah, well, um, just thanks again for the time. I appreciate uh, hopping in and speaking with everyone. And I know that today's topic was a little bit um, more almost philosophical in some ways. But again, I do really think that this is an aspect of sales that uh, uh, is, an, is an important thing to address and to work on you know, for anyone, um, salespeople, entrepreneurs, and people just generally living their lives. <laughs> thanks so much for the time. And please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if anyone has any questions or uh, any thoughts. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, James. Thank you. Hiroko-san, thank you for joining. Well, have a great mm. day and see you next time. Mm -hmm.